Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Americana country artist, songwriter, and musician, Will Ho. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from Music City, USA, the songwriting capital of the world, the last place to make a living in the music business. As always, <laughs> as always, I'm joined by my my co-host, my good friend of 12, 13, 14 years. It's been forever. Uh, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. For you guys in the know, Jim also plays drums. Jim, how you doing today, buddy? Doing well, man. How are you, Mr. Rich? <laughs> Jim has been stretching out his monster truck uh, morning radio show voice. No, this is how I talk normally. Come on. <laughs> Hey, so, so, you know, Jim, I'm always a fan of the people I have on the show, and we were talking off camera. Some of the best stuff, we lose some of the best conversational stuff before we start hitting the record button. But this gentleman is, I mean, he is a celebrated singer, songwriter, recording artist, a staple of the Nashville scene, very prolific. He's got a new record out that came out last October, Tiny Little Movies. Our friend Will Hogue. How are you, buddy? So good, man. How are you? Awesome, man. It is so. I was saying that such a fan. I've been following your work since uh, the first record, and it seems like every time I turn on Lightning 100 in Nashville, there was a 20 year period where I couldn't drive one mile without hearing a Will Hogue song. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're just a staple of this community, and I'm a huge fan. And we haven't, I said, you know, I haven't had more than a 30 second conversation with you in like 20 years. I'm about to celebrate, I think, 24 years in Nashville. And of course, you're a Nashvilleian. Yeah. You were born yeah, it's here. It's crazy. Like you said, I mean, when we Native. were talking just real briefly before we started, I mean, we've, you know, circles get smaller and smaller. We've been around and, and still to think that in the 20 years, 24 years now, you know, we haven't had this. We have now surpassed the longest conversation that we've ever had. <laughs> it's, so it's, uh, it's glad we could share this moment with <laughs> some other people. Yeah. And, you know, people, always, they would always say, Rich, you know, um, where do you go to like, where are the watering holes in Nashville? Like, where do musicians gather? And and I would say, yeah, back in the day, we used to all converge over at 12th and Porter yeah. and 3rd and Lindsley. These were the two clubs named after street intersections. <laughs> That's right. and, and, and we would, you know, we would get co-writes together and we would support our fellow bands. And I mean, I remember there was a period where at 12th and Porter, I would have my drum set up and I would be playing with the bands on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night because they were like, yeah. hey, this guy can read music and we don't have to rehearse very much. He could just leave his drum set up. And it was like yeah. a really cool period. And now, um, I don't know, a lot of things have changed. And like, we're musicians. I miss the Rutledge. I, the Sutler is, is, has changed. Do, do you get out? I've seen you like at the city winery. What do you mm -hmm. think of this new Nashville? Well, you know, growing up here, so it's it's double edged that sword. I mean, you know, a, a teenage me, if you'd have told me that we were going to have this caliber of music that you could see, you know, any night of the week, and you'd have these kind of restaurants that you could eat. I mean, you know, teenage me growing up here would have thought this was the greatest thing that's ever happened. I mean, yeah. there's a part, you know, you do sort of romantically long for those simpler times, like you just talked about. I mean, like those real. You know, those open mic nights that Daniel Tashin was doing at oh, yeah. 12th and Porter, you know, where it was just, there, it was so innocent. There, There is a a longing for that. And some of it is the city's changed, but I think some of it is also just that we have changed. You know, you think about what you and I have both accomplished and are continuing to work towards musically. And I think that, you know, if you had talked to either of us 20 years ago, we would have given a limb to be where we are at this point. And so, you know, and, and, and that is all of the good and bad shit that comes with it, you know? So I think you look back, cause just think of how simple that was. Like, you know, like you said, leaving your drum kit and just playing with every band and the only bars you could find your way to were the ones that named after the street corners cause you were too drunk to get to anywhere else. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was easy and it was, uh, you know, no one had wives and kids and, yeah. um, it was a simpler time for sure. But I think looking back, probably the music was shittier too. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, and you've accomplished so much. I mean, your name has been on the marquee. I'm sure there was like a lot of bucket list things that you dreamed of as a young musician that you have checked off. I mean, you've had 
tons of songs as a, as, I mean, a respected recording artist and then having your songs recorded by outside entities like the Eli Young band and licensing your music to sitcoms and films. I mean, I mean, those are pinch me things. Yeah. And it's never lost on me. You know, those are those moments, uh, you know, as we talk about how long we've done this, you know, I still remember those first moments of, you know, the first time you sell out 12th and Porter is really one of those moments like, holy shit, you know, this, this was a place I'd come to see, you know, my dad's band play when I was a kid. And Oh, your dad played music? Yeah, so he was in a band like, uh, he was, he and my uncle were like a uh, garage band, saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and everybody started a band, you know, here in Nashville. And they both had some regional success and, and did it until they had kids and then had to get real jobs. But <laughs> his band would do these re these reunion shows um, once or twice a year and they would play 12th and Porter. You know, at that time when you're 12 years old, I mean, that that's like, that's the coolest thing you've ever seen, man. Like, and to play that room, you know, and have that little balcony, I just, that was such an amazing place, you know, and then you grow and then, you, you know, the first time you play the rhyme and you check that box and, yeah. The first time you hear your song on the radio. I mean, you know, those things are huge. And there's a part of me that I still get excited. I mean, every time Lightning 100 plays a song on the radio or every time you play a sold out show, I still get the same buzz from it. And I think that that's part of the way to know that I still love doing. I think when that le when you lose that, it's probably time to, you know, look for another gig yeah. or do another job. Because there is a part that's still uh as much as i get you know I get, and I, I don't want to sound like captain sunshine here i mean there's plenty of frustrating stuff we can talk about too and i can you know i can make you want to walk off a, a pier with all of the horrible music business stories too but at the end of the day it's still just it's the coolest job in the world man. yeah for and sure it's, uh, and it's, yeah. there's a magic to it that i never ever i just refuse to let myself lose that well, your dad's got to be proud. I mean, both your parents, yeah. I mean, they. I hope, yeah, man. I mean, you know, we're, did they say, "Hey, you, maybe you, should, you know, think about something like a trade or a doctor or a lawyer"? Or did they just say, "All right, kid, three chords in the truth, go with it, man"? No, it well, you know, it's funny. Uh, do, you, do you have kids? I don't have kids. I, I, I this thing has been so consuming. <laughs> but that's, but that's why I, um, I like to teach and mentor a lot of kids. Well, you yeah, know, you, you know. I mean, so you understand. I mean, there is a point. He likes to take we, them and give them back. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. Rental kids yeah. are the best kind. So, yeah, I mean, I, I only ask because there is a point as a parent, too, you see it. Like, when I was growing up, my parents were really supportive. Um, you know, in high school, as you started to sort of put a garage band together, and do, you know, they we could always play at the house. They never cared about that. They were always big supporters of that. And then even when I went to went to college for a little bit thinking I was going to be a come back and be a school teacher and, and all of that. And, and they, you know, still had a band at that point and they thought that that was cool. And then it was, it was a real different tune once I quit school or, or get kicked out, depending on who you talk to. Um, Are you talking about college? College. Yeah. You know, so when you give up on that and then, you know, going to jump into music full time, their tune changed a little bit, you know, it became much more of a like, whoa, have we fully thought about this? Yeah. And, you know, my mom still has a letter. I wrote them a letter at one point that was still a thing, you know, and yeah. I basically absolved them of any wrongdoing in this. This wasn't their fault. It was sort of like, a, you know, when I hear my, my friends talk about coming out, this is the closest I ever did to coming out. It was like, <laughs> look, it's not your fault. This is just who I am. It's what I'm going to do with my life. And, and then they, um, once they realized that I was serious about it in a year or so, when it was not just, you know, trying to get together with your friends to smoke weed and, and stay up all night, you know, yeah. it was actually about trying to craft songs and, and play shows. And then they got real supportive and, you know, we laugh all the time because they would work the door, you know, remember playing 12th and Porter that you had to provide your own door. A, a door guy. You know, there was yeah. nobody there. And so, uh, my mom and dad would work the door and that is just awesome. shit tons of money. Cause no, they would let no one in. They were like, Nope. Every, you know, they're, you know, people are like I'm on the guest list. I can't on the list. Where's mom and dad. Nobody's on the list. You know, give us the money. 
That is so, funny. Yeah, they now, were supported. They well, were. who are, who are some of the characters in your in your in your first band? Because you've had a, some turnover over the years, you know. Like, yeah. and but I mean, I you know, when I was prepping for this interview, it was really pleasure. It was a great pleasure because I was just kind of going through your catalog, and at the time I was in Los Angeles, kind of split my time between the two places. I was running through all the hills and listening to Will Hogue music. Awesome. I mean, it was just so awesome. What what was the what was the first your first single what was it uh how did that all come about well the very first thing you know i started i had been in bands and then decided as bands you know all, always do they they fall apart <laughs> and you know it's just a matter of time and personalities and, and all that so i decided at that point i was tired of having to come up with a different band name every time and at that point i was kind of writing the songs too so i didn't want to do this thing of I just didn't want to, you know, start a band and write songs and then have to do something different every year, every six months. And so I decided I was going to start my own thing um, and just put together a group of dudes here in town. I had a, a drummer named Kirk uh, Yoko. I had met a bass player named Trace Sasser. And I think it was even through like, it may have even been one of those boards like at Corner Music, you know, with oh the bass God. player looking to start a band. And you pull the tabs off with the number. Yeah, I know, I know, tab. Kirk. I haven't seen him in forever. I have not either. Last I heard, he was in law school and, and oh, doing wow. like real work, which is great. Hmm. But so he, he and Trace had played together and, and we I got together and I showed them some songs and kind of wanted to put a band together. And, um, and then we got, we started talking about a guitar player and ended up... Uh, with Dan Baird from the Georgia Satellites as the the first guitar player, and you know, you know I that wore that just, I wore that record out. Will the uh, love songs for the hearing impaired? It's impaired. Just, that's, as, that's as good a rock and roll record as has ever been made. I think that's his Mona Lisa. Yeah, and I had it on cassette with my Walkman, yeah. my anti skip Walkman, <laughs> so I could run with the cassette and and it was um it, it was it really is a masterpiece. I mean, wow. And it still holds up. It does. And you know, and, and so Dan, you know, which is really unfair, you know, to to think that you know, here I'm this guy that's written eight songs probably at that point. You know, I barely got enough to do a you know it's probably 10. I probably got 10 or 12 songs that are worth a shit at that point, but yeah. maybe 20 that we could, <laughs> you know, at least make our way through. And, you know, to, to have that guy come and be in your band is like, yeah. it's like somebody coming to you on your 16th birthday and giving you a Ferrari and going like, you can, you know, you can't have it, but you can drive it for as long as you want to. And but he saw something in you. So maybe he was kind of like, it was kind of like a cool, like a mentor type dude in the band. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I, and originally he had wanted to produce a record and I just, um, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't feel like, but I was ready to, I really wanted to tour and I wanted to play a bunch. And yeah. it's crazy, man. I mean, I think about how shitty the conditions and the money were at that. I mean, we were touring the four of us in a Ford Explorer with no trailer. Uh, and you know, the band might make a hundred bucks a night. So wait a minute, That's all the gear band. was in the back, all the gear. I mean, it was two little amps, a tiny bass rig and a four piece kit. I mean, we would just cram shit in there. Wow. And then we got to where we rented a U-Haul trailer. Um, and we just go out for weekends, you know, we'd stay in one hotel room and, um, but again, there was a there was a real simplicity to it. And There's something, yeah. It. And the in your twenties, you do that shit. It's like, yeah, and yeah, you know, and, and again, you look back on it. I, I still I look back on it really fondly, and it was cool because it, you know, the the songs I, I, I'm still proud of a lot of that. And then having Dan involved, it just changed the perception of it because all of a sudden, um industry folks or fans would kind of go like, well, this, maybe there's something to this. If this guy's jumping in this, you know, this Ford Explorer, maybe we should give this a list. And then shortly thereafter, um, I signed a publishing deal here in town with a company in, in LA and then in here in Nashville with a, a division of Warner Chapel. And they, um, it was a little bit before you were kind of doing records on your own. So I feel like we were a little ahead of the curve on that, but I just, you know, signed an artist deal, not a Nashville writers deal. And we yeah. took that money and made the first 
record. And then, you know, again, and just in a different time, you know, that was it where you could just sort of, you know, so there was no plan, you know, we went yeah. in, we made part of it here in Nashville at the producer's house. And then we went to Memphis to Ardent Studios and did the, the other half, yeah, which was really magical too. Sure. You know, getting to have those two musical palettes to draw from on your first record was pretty special. And then, um, you know, like just then the way weird shit would happen at that point when you're just young and, and flying around doing whatever, you know, the yeah. lighting one, we were playing in Nashville kind of every chance we could get. And then we would just go out on the weekends and tour kind of, you know, we do Birmingham and Knoxville and Memphis and Louisville and Routing, just yeah. branch out. And right about the same time, there was a station in Birmingham and a station here in Nashville, Lighting 100. And they started playing. Um, Miss Williams was the first thing that they played off of that record. And, yes. You know, all of a sudden then A&R people would go like, well, what's this unreleased unsigned band? And, and then it just kind of, so you asked, so this is the 20 minute answer to your, what was the first single? <laughs> Miss Williams was the first single. Um, well, that's great. It all snowballs from there, man. You know, it's a, it's the rocket, right? You light the fuse. Yeah. And then you don't know how long it lasts and, you know, and then it blows up and you pack it and light it again and just yeah. keep doing it. And I, and I feel like, you know, the, the rock is always there in your music. There's an, and there's a tip of the hat to the, to respecting, of course, you know, the three chords and the truth of country music. And then there's this, there's folk elements and it's your writing has evolved over the years. Um, for me, I just, do you, do you ever take offense to someone associating you with Americana music? Because it's such a broad term. Now for me personally, I love Steve Earle. I love Mellencamp. I love Lucinda. Yeah. Williams. I mean, that is my crack. I mean, it's like if I had a, you know, everybody has a different career fantasy. Like if I didn't, if I wasn't a session drummer type dude, I would love to be a three chord troubadour and go around with my songs and talk about heartbreak. And, but God didn't really give me the pipes or that thing. That's not, my calling in life but right. but i am a sucker for storytelling and as mm -hmm. a drummer it's such a pleasure to help bring those things to life because i'm such a fan of it well that's cool uh, well thanks and that's that i mean it's one of the give and takes about music and you know my favorite drummers and, and you know it'd, it'd be fun to get to work together on something at some point for that yeah. reason because i really love you know, and the session thing here in Nashville for folks that don't do this shit for a living, I don't know that they fully understand, you know, the way that this works. Like, you know, I just write a song here in my room and then, you know, you throw up a, a, a little money at some folks and they show up and they write these charts out. And then like <laughs> in fairly short order, like you've got this incredibly well produced song and yeah. the, but the difference to me is the guys that i really love are the ones like you just described where it's not it's not the number chart it's like i like the drummer that goes what's the lyric yeah you, you know? gotta because you gotta know the, the story really, yeah like it's important and you know and those are the and those are the difference in sessions and songs that really make a difference you know sure. and, and again when and maybe and you know it and I know there's the ones that you play on that you're like, that's special, yep. you know, and there's the ones that you hear that's like, it's good. Thank God yeah. that paid. And that it might be a hit, but it's like, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you the, doesn't give you the chicken skin, you know, and those, yeah. those are the, the moments that keep us all going. But. Yeah. And what is the, the, now, if you had to look back on your career so far, you're very prolific, at least 12 records. Um, do you have a favorite song? Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's probably cliched, but I mean, even if it breaks your heart is the one, I mean, I'd be, I could be the cool artist guy and sit here and name some obscure stuff that's really heartbreaking, but I mean, the reason I have a, a computer to talk to you on and a house to do it from is because of even that's, if it breaks your heart. Yeah, and, I, and I, favorite I, fucking song. Yeah, yeah. man, and, and <laughs> I, have, I have a friend who has that tattooed on his body. Uh, that's amazing. I yeah. mean, you know, and that's one, that's another one that the, uh, you know, that song was not special. When we, And, you know, I could tell you these stories about, like, you know, how much we labored on it. And the truth of the matter is, like, when Pazley and I wrote that, Pazley was the intern at his publishing company. And basically nobody would write with it. Wow. And I didn't co-write. 
And so I had been in this accident and I couldn't really do anything. I'd had months and months of not doing shit. I couldn't tour. I couldn't hold a guitar. And so I finally gotten back to where I was, I was able to at least hold a guitar, but I was still on a walker. And so he and I would occasionally get together and write. We'd written once before we got together that day. I was late because uh, again, I was limping everywhere. I had to get dropped off at the session, like a fucking school kid. Like I'll be back to get you at three. (laughs) And I had to go to rehab again that day. This was your motorcycle accident? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, that's You're lucky, man. You really came out. Oh, no. it, it was pretty lucky, man. But so, you know, like we wrote that song in probably an hour and a half. I mean, and there were no, there were no edits, man. We just like the, he had a part of a musical idea and he had Keep On Dreaming. And I thought that was too cheesy. And I added, even if it breaks your heart. And he thought that was too fucking dark. And then we just wrote the story mm. of me standing outside the exit in waiting for a band to play and him growing up in Texas. And the next thing you know, it was this tune. And, you know, it's been, it was a life changing thing for, for he and for I and for yeah. the Eli Young band. I mean, beautiful. So congrats. Yeah, that's, well, yeah, thanks, man. And, you know, that's the reason you still get up. Every day to do this. Shit. Yeah. There, I mean, you know, and, maybe it'll happen again. And so, so uh, s- up to then you didn't make a habit out of co-writing or you had never co-written. I had, but only in a real rock and roll set, like Dan Baird and I would write together or my yeah. bass player and I would write together, you know, but nothing as far as, or very little as far as, you know, the Nashville show up at 10 and write a song kind of thing. Yeah, is that you? Do you do you did you ever subscribe to that, or do you are you on that schedule now? Are you do you write with people on Zoom or like what? What's man? The- yeah, well, so the Zoom thing, you know, with with COVID, I mean, we've all had to adjust. I'm sure you're doing Zoom. I mean, are you doing Zoom drum sessions? Zoom, like yeah, Zoom, everything. Yeah, Zoom like consultations, Zoom speeches, yeah. Zoom lessons. Ugh. And it's, so it's you know, there's a ton of FaceTime stuff, and I really and truly because I'm. I'm a little bit uncomfortable in the co-writing situation. So long answer to your short question, do I do that? I didn't for years. And then with yeah. the, even if it breaks your heart thing, you know, all of a sudden I went from being an artist to I was a, I was a songwriter in people's eyes here in town. And so all of a sudden somebody comes and writes you a check to, you know, Hey, for four years, we'd like for you to get paid to write songs. And, I was like, fuck yeah, I'll, I'll give that a shot. And, yeah, you probably got a good I publishing did. deal after that. Yeah, and so, you know, I wrote a, I wrote some good songs. I didn't love the process, uh, and I'm not very good at it, so I thought that I was going to be done with that, and I did a few more years of just doing shit on my own. And uh, over the last year or so, I've gotten back to a, a publishing situation with a company that I feel like understands my strengths and what I want to do. And so... We have been, I have been co-writing a little bit more and the Zoom thing, I thought I would just detest. And um, it really and truly, uh, I haven't mind. I really have, I mean, it's not as organic as, you know, it's not as great as sitting in a room with somebody and really connecting, but you know, no different. I mean, I'd much rather be sitting with you and having coffee and doing this, but yeah. This I mean, I'm not wearing pants. Not I, I'm not wearing yeah. pants right now. And yeah, it's right. Jim's, not, Jim's not wearing pants. We weren't going to stand up. During this. <laughs> I can prove yeah. it. No. So I, just, I mean, we've done it and um, it's just not that bad, man. Again, if my biggest complaint about my job is that I got to do a FaceTime co-write, um, I'm not going to complain too much about that. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS number 39179. NMLS consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. 
nothing could be truer about energy efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's great about the folks out there that might not know about intellectual property and how publishing works, the, the interesting thing about songwriting is that it, it becomes intellectual property. You put words and chords together. The government sees it as intellectual property. Then you can license it. The, there's a, the publishing comes in, it turns into cash. And it's, it's those hits that are COVID proof. That's, it's probably what a lot of songwriters are using to get through COVID. Yeah. Because we can't go out and entertain people, right? We can't take the music to the people. I, have you been doing any uh, broadcasting? Like, hey, fans, I'm going to do a live thing every Monday night at 6 o'clock. Yeah, so I've been revisiting. You know, when it first, when everything first shut down, kind of like everybody, it was just, yeah, I'm going to go live at, you know, 7 o'clock. And then we did that for a, a handful of times, and it was fine. But then you also get to where it's like, why? Why do I want these fans? You know, why would they want to come and see this again? And so we got to a point, I started a series called How Did We End Up Here? Where I'm going back and, and revisiting each of the individual albums. And so, which has been really fun. So I'll, I'll play a couple of things acoustically and then listen back sort of like a behind the music. Like I'll play the actual track from the record and talk about that's great how the guitar part came about or, you know, who played on what. And it's kind of been, I was talking to Brendan Benson yesterday about, he had just done a, an album podcast about his first record and he was talking about how much he hated it. And, you know, the, the looking back thing I'm really shitty at, because I feel like I, you know, records, I don't really go back and spend a lot of time listening to, you know, stuff from the past. And, yeah. you know, some of the things are kind of cringy, but then there's also some really innocent, beautiful stuff in there too. But, you know, Absolutely. reliving the stories and the people that were there, it's been really, even for me, it's been, it's been really pretty fun. I look forward to it. That's interesting that you're a looking forward guy. Like you, you want to acknowledge what you've accomplished and you know, you went after your dreams and checked a lot of the boxes, but you're, you're looking forward. Like I'm the same way, like the eyes on the prize, like what else can we do? You know? <laughs> yeah. And so I don't spend a ton of time with that, but then there's also a point, you know, where we've laughed, you know, there's enough records under the belt to, you know, and, and the band changes and then you got to learn songs again. And so there's moments, you know, we'll go to a show and somebody will request a song occasionally. And it's like, sure. And, you know, you get eight bars into it. And it's like, I don't remember any of this shit. Like, I don't remember the second verse. I don't have, I have no clues. So it's been kind of fun to get to go back and, and dig in a little bit for sure. Yeah. People love that. They love that spontaneous. I saw you at the basement East before, like it had to be the end of last year or very early or the end, geez, the end of 2019 or early That's 2020. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was like up there, man, sweating and just enjoying myself. I mean, God, how lucky we were to have that. We didn't know how lucky we were, were all crammed in there in that hot place. I know it's crazy, man. You know, and, and I just, that's the thing. I mean, I was just talking about it with my, my kids downstairs. I mean, that's the big, I never thought I, I kind of always knew, you know, there's a point in, in your career where you always say that you'll miss touring because it's sort of the right thing to say. Like, oh, yeah, I miss the road. And the yeah. truth of the matter is you're like, I don't miss the fucking road. Like, I'm so glad to be home. <laughs> and we've finally reached a point where it really is like, I do, man, I miss it. Like, I miss the camaraderie of, you know, of the, the hang. I mean, yeah. not to mention, I mean, the show and shit, of course, like the, 
the, the buzz you miss, but just even the camaraderie, just hanging with the guys in the van or on the bus or backstage. And absolutely. Oh my God. It's just such a vital part. I don't think I realized until, you know, November <laughs> of just how vital that has sort of been to my overall wellness for a long time. Absolutely. The, yeah. Just, I mean, I'm with the same guys for 21 years. We finished each right. other's sentences, you know, and it's, we're part of each other's DNA and um, man, yeah, I have really missed that. Um, Jim, do you, you have a natural curiosity about the songwriting process? You got any, got any questions in you, man? You're a little quiet today. I'm just listening. Well, get in there, I man. One he saved the golden pipe for that voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> Will, I have one. I have one thought. Actually, I used to play out in cover bands back when I was in my twenties, and I go back to thinking about how great that would be to do again. And it is something on my uh, radar to do down the road uh, once you know certain things are done. And uh, I wouldn't mind doing that again in a cover band situation or tribute band. Um, yeah. But there are elements of that lifestyle that uh a 20 year old can certainly bear better than our guys our age you know about that particular lifestyle what's one thing you wouldn't look forward to going back to <laughs> okay um for me it would be I like mean, the two o'clock two or three o'clock mornings you know yeah those are tough and and honestly the it's a big part of it for me is the food like the idea of you know uh, shitty diner food at two in the morning yeah. is great. It's two in the morning. It's really bad about nine 30. The next, you know, nine 30 in the morning. It's Especially if you go to waffle house and you're like, what? And you just do. Happened? That's the thing. Yeah. And you yeah. do like, it's yeah. just, you know, and I think that, like that's gotten Some of my so much best easier, meals. But, yeah, man. That's, we that's used to do the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the three 34 o'clock in the morning meal runs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good time well, to eat. <laughs> And, you know, talking about Waffle House, that was one of my earliest road lessons, again, and one of the beauties of having Dan Baird in your band, you know, he had all of the road and rock and roll experience at that point, and he introduced me no. to Waffle House. Are you familiar with Heated and Treated? No, not that combination. Okay, sort of. so here we are. So when you go to Waffle House, you're going to ask for pie. You're going to order your pie, heated and treated, and they're going to then take your pie, and they're going to put it on the flat top grill, and they're going to get it hot, and they're going to put a dollop of butter on it, and then they're going to give it to you. And butter to in the butter pie. On the pie. On the hot-ass pie with a scoop of butter. And it is... It is glorious. Oh, uh, I was gonna. I was gonna say, see. yeah, because I'm a pie guy. Some guys are cake guys, but any kind of no. cream, banana cream, chocolate cream, coconut chocolate cream, cream. I'm in. You know, I yeah, up I'm in uh, where we used to play out. Up in it was usually in the uh, New York, Connecticut area is where we used to play out, and we'd come be coming back from these bars. Now up there, if you're familiar with that area, they have a glut of diners, either Italian or Greek, Greek run diners, yeah. and. They are fantastic. I mean, the food you get, it's completely horrible for you, but my gosh, you want to indulge. <laughs> the menu's that thick. It's incredible. It. They're not, yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, they're, they're like, you know, leather clad, big old menus most yeah, of the time. Yeah, you can have like a Thanksgiving my, dinner. Right. Yeah. But I mean, we took our kids back in, to New pop. York. We, we took our kids back, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago to take them to New York. And we, we stopped at a diner to show them what the diner, it's still tastes the same it's still <laughs> that good and we ordered what used to be my my you know and, and i've got the heated and treated pie thing beat because i had i called it the heart attack on a plate <laughs> and essentially it was french fries with beef gravy and cheese oh my god oh my gosh with yeah. a chocolate milkshake <laughs> oh my god jim i know it was like four thousand yeah. calories like two days on the peloton right there <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, when you're you know, 19, 20, right. 21 years old, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's an hour of living. There was but, one man, period of, of Jim's life. Memories. Jim, Jim, at one period of his life, did the, the Body for Life thing, the Bill Phillips thing, where he was eating protein pancakes and shakes, and he was all okay. shredded and ripped. And, and then, then, he got, then he married Courtney, and she's an amazing I'm cook. I'm just, no, I'm just saying you're, you're a little, little thicker, <laughs> but, I mean, you look, still look great. I mean, a little thicker. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so while it's we're in this... <laughs> While we're in this comedic mode, let's do, your, do you want to do your five questions? Yeah, we're going to do the, we're going to do the fave five. So, um, as fast as possible, uh, All right. I'm favorite, gonna, I'm going to pull up a music bed. Hold on. Okay. Tension bed. Uh, yeah, here we go. Go. Favorite food. Uh, sushi. 
Oh yeah. Favorite color? Brown. Wow. Favorite song? Let it be. Beautiful. Favorite movie? Star Wars. Oh my God. We were so alike. And then who is your celebrity, favorite celebrity crush that your wife might give you a hall pass for? Uh, 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 Kira Knightley. Oh, wow. Okay. Very proper. Wow. Very nice. Okay. okay. That was so easy. No, Some done. people are like, um, er, uh, that was fast. No, no we, can, we can do it. I can give you five more. If you want to do it again, I'll give you a whole different set of answers. <laughs> but that's a, I, I love that you're a Star Wars guy There's because shit going on here. Yeah. yeah. The Star Wars is like the perfect story of good and evil and romance. And it's like Shakespearean. It's like oh, amazing. It, and you know, it's fun. Like uh, now that my, cause my boys are 13 and 10. And so they've wow. gotten hip to it, you know, and then kind of getting to watch, you know, all this new stuff that's coming out with Disney plus and all that. And seeing it through their eyes is, uh, it just has made me fall in love with it even, even further. So, wow. Yeah. Now, they, is it true? Do you think that they're, you're either a star Wars person or a Marvel person? Well, we're both in this house, so I don't know. Oh, yeah. and I, you know, I think you could do the, the star Wars, star Trek thing. Maybe you yes. can argue about, yeah. but then uh, there's a uh, battle star Galactica. Yeah, which is the old one, you know, I haven't watched it. There's a newer series that I didn't watch. I watched yeah. that, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, I loved that, too. Yeah, me too. Cylons. Yeah, man. <laughs> so do, do your kids say, Dad, this original Star Wars sucks. It's all paper mache and guys in costumes. <clears throat> or do they like the new CGI stuff? They, well, they, they're a little bit partial to, they love the story of the old ones, but they do love, and I mean, I can't argue with them. Like, the new ones are far um more visually uh, uh, appealing. I yeah, think, yeah for sure. sure. And, you know, but, but I love what they're doing. Like the Mandalorian bit, I thought was, you know, that whole series has been great. So they've, they, they're, they're equal opportunity Star Wars fans. They like all of them. No. They'll even watch the prequels. So they're, uh, so that's okay. So, <laughs> yeah. I've just gotten so confused with the last few that they put out that I was yeah. like, okay, that's, that's fun. You know? Yeah. No, yeah. Then uh, there was solo was Luke. Yeah. 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 Well, Solo fills in the blank between, uh, I guess, uh, what was it six months in between something and uh, the A New Hope? I was believe that, so. Uh, yeah. And then you got Rogue One, which is my favorite one, which is a whole yeah. other story. But yeah. So and that uh, took place what between? Uh, that's right before A New Hope. And, uh, a new hope. Yeah, it ends I'm, as New Hope is is starting. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Hmm. You gotta be careful talking about the Star Wars shit though, because this is almost dangerous. This is all we'd almost be better off talking about politics. Like people yeah. start going like, "That's not really right. true." Like, yeah, actually, uh, you, you know, internet trolls. Well, Jim was the guy that told me. He said, "You know what? If you if you have haters, and and I and you probably feel the same way. I would assume if you have haters, you're doing something right. You're putting it out there. You're just unapologetic. Like, this is me. This is what I do. I'm looking for my tribe. And and if you hate it, then I must be doing something good." Yeah, yep. well, you're at least reaching somebody, right? So, <laughs> what I hate is, at, we talk about that with records, you know, because you'll get, when you put a record out, you know, one of the early lessons is like, you never really read the review, or you can't believe the reviews. Like, if you're going to believe yeah. the good ones, then you also got to believe the bad ones. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, so it's not worth it. But I would much rather, in live shows too, like, I'm cool if people love it. I'm cool if people hate it. I hate when people are apathetic about it, though. Like, the guy in the audience that's just like, whatever like you know that, jesus this pisses me off life. like you know like be pissed off and leave i'm cool with that reaction but like don't just sit there like you're fucking bored like, well nashville is sense. is so notorious for the for the academic audience that's like taking mm-hmm. notes you know yeah. and, and they don't come up front but, like i'll know you go to birmingham and they're like they're star for entertainment and they'll rush right up to the monitors and the, but in nashville it's rare that you get they're they're hanging back yeah, everybody's got to be a little cooler here. And I think that is something that's changed more over the, you know, as Nashville's gotten much more cosmopolitan. We have. Uh, I know you like sushi. Cosmopolitan. We didn't have sushi 24 years ago. That's for sure. Mm. No, well, not one that you'd eat anyway. Nope. That's for damn sure. Yeah, that's for sure. No, not at all. I'd really like it if he'd wear a beanie on his head with some glassless frames and a beard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that, you know, they're talking through their teeth and yeah, smiling nothing. and talking you know, all the not doing it for me, Martha. Mm-hmm. You're, you're nuts, man. Eat a pork pie hat there, Martha. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Just hang back here. We don't want to show that we're too interested in this artist, Martha. That's yeah. <laughs> so right. Clap like this. Like, mm. Holding. <laughs> you, do, you do the beatnik snap. That's right. There you go. I've done that before if I have a drink Holding. in my hand or like, you know. Uh, 
I've been guilty yeah. of that. So That's I don't want, we don't want to keep it too long, man. Cause you got, you got hits to write. You got, you, for, do you have a uh, 10 COVID written songs for your next record or what do you think? What's on the horizon? Man, we're pretty close. Yeah. I've been, um, I, I really have discovered in this off time, you know, I've, I've been trying to pay more attention to writers. I got some friends that are novelists and some guys that I've become closer with that are, you know, I thought he said rioters. <laughs> rioters. No, like, that's just right. my, that's my accent. Get some inspi yeah. inspiration there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's inspiration, but I'm on the other side of that one. Um, it's true. Yeah. You know, really just trying to <clears throat> write more. I've put myself on a schedule to really write every day, whether it's just, freeform gibberish or, or, or song. And yeah, so the, the productivity I've been pretty excited about and the songs I'm hoping, you know, maybe the middle of this year we'll get to record and, and, and put something else out. Nice. Well, yeah. man, I, 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 I own the, a golden tambourine, this tambourine. I will come right. literally and I'll just put it on beat four of every other measure. And you're, you're welcome just, anytime. Just, just I mean, one yeah. song. I just like, ah, <laughs> that's, that's, so the like, uh, that's the money. That's the money. I, okay. I had a tiger. Yeah, I had the tiger. The tambourine is the loudest thing in the mix. I yeah. love that, man. Yeah, yeah go yeah, check, go check that song out. And uh, man, I do <laughs> want to tell you, you know, uh, it, I think it's great what you're doing with this and and all that. But I want to tell your fans that are here, you know, it was really cool. One of my favorite things when uh, a few years ago, when I sort of started to dabble, you know, had a record that made it into the country world. Yeah. And we started playing some of those festivals and things like that. There was a festival in Ohio that you guys were on as the headliners. We were real early in the day, but we were playing outside and it started raining and all of our gear got soaked like my amp. And it started to go out during the show. And it was cool, man. You guys and your crew went and got brand new amps out of the bus, out of the box and set them up on stage and plugged wow. in for us to play and finish our set. And that's just one of those that, has never been lost on me. And I wanted to thank you, you know, and, and your, your peeps. Cause that was, Oh man, that was a classy move. Man. Those guys are, it's been the same guys for so long and they are just salt of the earth, hard working guys, man. Well, it shows man. And it's just cool too. You know, as we talk about Nashville and how much it's changed over the years, you know, it goes through these spells, I think where it's like the, you know, everybody's real competitive or the country guys don't like the rock guys or the rock guys don't like the Americana guys. And I feel like, we've finally just gotten to this homeostasis where it's like, man, we're all just trying to, everybody's just trying to yeah. play the songs they want to play and, and do shows. And, and that was just a perfect example of it, man. Yeah. It, uh, that has carried with me and the guys in the band and our skeleton crew for every day since then. So well, that's cool. amazing. Well, I remember being side stage for a lot of things, just going, this kicks ass. I, I, I hope this audience appreciates this shit. You know what I mean? It's like really great, man. <laughs> I've, yeah, thank you, man. I've always been a fan. Hey, Jim, it's that time, man. Yeah. It is that time. Here. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. It's like we've got questions everywhere here, Will. We've got love the this. favorite five, and now we've got the random question, <laughs> which is truly a random question. Are you ready? I'm always ready. All right, here we go. Now we got attention, bed. Nice. <laughs> what set of items could you buy that would make the cashier the most uncomfortable? Uh, what, what store? Yeah, it's Kroger. Kroger. Okay. Um, a plunger, condoms, uh, a morning after pill, um, and a copy of Boys Life magazine. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and a Bible. Wait, do they have a Bible? If they've got a Bible, and a Bible. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I was I was gonna go with like lube, you know, like just like you know, yeah. lube and mac and cheese, you know. No, but no, no, no. the Boys Life magazine just put it over the edge. Yeah, I don't know if yeah, they sell that, that but funny. the Bible you can interchange either one of those. Yeah, any sort of religious no. scripture text. Will be oh right. my God, songwriters and comedians—they are fast on their feet, man. <laughs> I tell you what, man. Will, this has been such a pleasure to talk to you, man. 
Likewise, man. I really appreciate. And sorry, you know, we we run around and with all the COVID understanding, I appreciate that. Oh yeah. So you, there was a there was a thing at your kid's school. Everything okay? Yeah, it's great. It's just my wife teaches. Uh, she's the counselor at the school where my youngest son goes. And then they were shutting things down for a while. Somebody had COVID, and then somebody got over it, and somebody got it again. It's just the shit that we're all dealing with. Yeah, for sure. You know, we are in this together for sure, man. Everybody, check out willhogue.com, The latest record, tiny little movies, and of course, there's eleven others so check those all out uh, pull them up on spotify you will not be disappointed man mad respect i really appreciate you joining us today man man i appreciate it and stay in touch we'll talk soon absolutely jim thank you for your time and talent and everybody out there hey if you have questions comments i got an email address for you the rich redman show at gmail.com write us a letter we'll read it on the air and as always subscribe share rate and review it helps people find our podcast keep coming back for the good stuff we'll see you next time thanks will Thanks, man. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.